I have offered our lovely sales assistant, Danielle Harrison here, $10,000 to shave a fucking head! Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> The film Wolf of Wall Street will go down in history as one of the most epic Wall Street films. Sure we had Gecko in Wall Street Money Never Sleeps, but this was far better than that. We got to see some outstanding acting. Well let's talk about this for a second. Why didn't Leonardo DiCaprio win an Oscar for this? I think we really need to rethink how the Oscars are awarded. However, that's the story for another day. Back to the film. Banking excesses are often shrouded in secrecy, but this time, through this film, the lead came off. And boy oh boy, was it greed, lust, gluttony, all the excesses we've always imagined. However, before we look at the lessons from The Wolf of Wall Street, we need to understand how this film came about. This is a story of how one fraud was used to showcase another fraud. Interesting fact in our opinion is that we think both perpetrators came off pretty lightly. To understand how the film came about, you have to look at one of the biggest frauds in the history of sovereign world funds, 1MBD. 1MBD was a fund started in 2015 by the then Prime Minister of Malaysia, Najib Razak. The fund was meant to be used as a way of developing Malaysia. However, it turned out that the fund ended up benefiting the Prime Minister and his close associates. In the end, the scandal will stretch its tentacles across multiple geographical locations and include the investment bank Goldman Sachs. In total, a grand amount of 4.5 billion was swindled out of the fund. Funds went on to buy artwork, a yacht, a New York and London properties and a glittering 23 million diamond stone for Najib Brazak's wife. Which brings us back to the film. The central character in this fraud was a guy called Jolo who had the good sense to finance the making of Wolf of Wall Street. It's just one of those weird things I suppose. It took a major fraud to bring fruit to one of the best Wall Street films about fraud. Crazy, right? In market-based economies, prices send signals to buyers and sellers. An example of how people respond to incentives is when you end up buying two products because of a half price offer on the second product when really you intended to buy just one. We're able to see examples of this in the current uh, vaccination climate where some communities are able to increase uptake of the vaccines based on some sort of incentives. And in the film, uh, Jordan Belfort was able to do that, uh, for example in this case, get the lady to get a haircut uh, by offering commissions to his staff. Lesson number two, it's all about supply and demand. The free market acts as a rationing and signaling device. Higher prices lead to lower demand, whereas on the other hand, sellers are willing to supply more at higher prices. This leads to disequilibrium in the marketplace, which can only be taken away when sellers lower their prices to meet demand. Lesson number three, diminishing marginal utility. Satisfaction or utility diminishes the more we consume a product. An example of this is the first glass of cold Coca-Cola uh, on a hot day will give you the highest amount of satisfaction. However, this will fall on the second, third or fourth glass of Coca-Cola. In the film, we're able to see that the exception to this is drugs. So habit forming goods like drugs, alcohol, etc. are the exception to this rule as noted by the large amount of quaaludes that Jordan Belfort took to get even greater harm. Lesson number four, the rich have creative ways of raising and hiding that cash in plain sight. In this example, Jordan Belfort bought his wife a yacht. Rich people do this all the time. This can either be written off as a tax expense when done right, or it can be used as something called an ELOC, which is an equity line of credit. This is where you raise a loan secured against an asset uh, like in this case, a yacht. The release funds can be used for investment purposes while you also enjoy your asset. It's a win-win situation. Lesson number five, where do billionaires hide their wealth? 
Well, it used to be Switzerland and still is to a greater degree. However, there is now an influx of tax havens ranging from Puerto Rico, if you don't fancy straying away from the United States, Malta, the Bahamas, St. Kitts and lately Dubai. All these countries allow you to open up a shelf company and you can basically move your friends around without too much hassle. Lesson number six. Markets seem to be a good way of organizing economic activity. Take a look at IPOs. Not sure what an IPO is? Here's Leonardo explaining IPOs. IPO is an initial public offering. It's the first time a stock is offered for sale to the general population. Now, as the firm taking the company public, we set the initial sales price, then sold those shares right back to our friends. The I Look, <laughs> I know you're not following what I'm saying anyway, right? That's, that's okay, that doesn't matter. The real question is this, was all this legal? Sadly, most IPAs are flawed, or more importantly, the stock market is broken. This allowed people like Jordan Belfort to rig the system in his favour. This is still prevalent today with major investors being privy to pre-market trading and insider trading is still an issue. Lesson 7. We looked at some of the ways in which rich people hide their wealth in Lesson 5. Well, what if the cash is illegal? It was the case in The Wolf of Wall Street. Well, that's super easy still. Money laundering is still a huge problem in 2021. In fact, up to $2 trillion was laundered in 2020 alone, according to recent data from Deloitte. While the story from the film shows how laundering still occurs, it is so much easier now with cryptocurrency uh, being more prevalent and widespread. Lesson number eight, income elasticity of demand. There's a positive correlation between an increase in income, as seen in the film, and demand for normal goods. So normal goods can be split into two types, necessities and luxury goods. Demand for necessities is said to be inelastic when incomes go up, i.e. if you win the lottery, you're not going to start buying more bread or sold, for example. However, for luxury products like fast cars and fancy houses in the film, demand goes up massively when incomes go up. Lesson number nine, opportunity cost. This is the best alternative for gone. In the film, Jordan Belfort had the opportunity to take it slow, grow steadily. However, by choosing the fast blow up route, he ended up imploding. Economics serves as a reminder that every decision we take, there is a trade-off and an alternative for gone. Lesson number 10. This is our opportunity to say something that might be construed as controversial. The law seems to treat white-coloured crime more leniently than if you are poor and commit a petty crime. History is littered with examples of this. Bernie Madoff. Bankers from the 2008 financial collapse, Paul Manafort for example. Make no mistake about it, The Wolf of Wall Street is an amazing film. However, the perpetrators of those evils, Jordan Belfort, have emerged relatively unscathed from this and are enjoying a crack at fame. Certainly, the people who funded the film, Joe Law, etc., have still not paid for their crimes. Sadly, it is the hard-working people who are the real victims of their criminal activities. Hey, this is Godfrey Duber. Thank you for staying over till the end. I um, hope you enjoyed this expose of uh, Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, please remember to like and subscribe to the channel and looking forward to seeing you next time. Cheers. Bye-bye.